Uh, let's just start with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we just uh, do just thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word. I just ask, Lord, that you'd help us each to uh, learn the things that you have for us from your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so apparently, Steve, uh, the messages are f affecting me and Kevin the same way, because <laughs> uh, the topic that's been on my mind that we're talking about today is suffering <laughs> and persecution. <laughs> so um, uh, as, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, uh, suffering, however, in, in general, for, first I want to talk about just suffering in general. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, Suffering is a, just a universal condition experienced by all men, whether you're Christian or not, wherever you live. Um, uh, one of the truths about suffering is that suffering does not have an absolute value. In other words, you can't look at a chart on the wall and say, well, let's see, I, I did this and this, ah, I'm suffering. <laughs> it, you, it's, not, it's not absolute, it's very relative. Um, you can, uh, we can, uh, maybe to illustrate, we can all think of probably a time when we felt like we were starving, right? And there may be even some of us here who feel like they're starving more than once a day. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and that's okay. However, probably none of us have actually starved, right? Now, if we had a guy up here who actually had experienced significant starvation, you know, and they, they might be say, look, you don't, you people don't know what you're talking about. You <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't actually diminish the fact when you feel really hungry and you feel like you're starving. So suffering is a relative thing. You, you can't just say this, no, no, that was starving and you're not, so, so you don't really, you're not really suffering. It, it just doesn't work that way. Right? We've all had a, had a hangnail probably before. Right? It's pretty painful. It hurts. Um, you know, you, you might have a hangnail. A guy might come up and say, you know, I lost my whole hand. What are you whining about? But does that make your hangnail hurt any less? No, it doesn't. It still, it still really hurts. <laughs> so suffering is relative. You can't, you can't just define it or say, this is suffering, this is not. It's, it depends on, on how you feel and, and the condition you're in. You might have had grief at the loss of an aunt or an uncle or a cousin. Somebody else might come up and say, hey, I just lost my mom and dad. D does that make you any less grieving over an aunt or an uncle? No, no, no. So it's relative, and, and it doesn't do any good really to compare and say, hey, I, you know, I, I lost this. You only lost that. You have no right to, you, you, you shouldn't feel that way. It, it's just... Um, not how it works. So suffering is a universal thing. It's relative. Each one of us uh, may feel grief and suffer in a different way. Um, and it's, um, <laughs> sometimes it may be helpful because we should have a better attitude about it. But, um, but it, doesn't, it doesn't help to point fingers and say, well, your suffering doesn't count or that's not, uh, that, that's not good. Um, you know, actually, Proverbs 14.10 tells us that each heart knows its own bitterness and a stranger does not share its joy. So part of the truth there is that each heart has, has a unique perception and understanding of, of suffering and bitterness and joy. Part of the also, also the truth of that verse is that each heart will know suffering. Uh, you know, uh, kids are especially susceptible to this uh, false line of thinking, which is just that if I just had something else, I'd be fine, <laughs> right? <laughs> if I had what he had, I'd be, everything would be okay. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work that way. <clears throat> uh, suffering, suffering is going to occur uh, no matter what your situation. Um, kids, uh, if you think that if you just lived in a different house, with different brothers and sisters, with different parents, <laughs> your life would be fine. It's just not how it works. So no matter, no matter what family we're in, where, what condition our life is in, we're going to encounter suffering. 
Uh, there's going to be different degrees and, and it just can't be compared because each heart is going to be sensitive to its own suffering. Um, whether, whether you are the, the son of a king living in a palace or the son of a pauper living in a cardboard box, there's going to be suffering. And, and you might be tempted to say, if you're living in the cardboard box, well, I would love to suffer in the palace. Right? But that's not the right attitude. It's, it's, it doesn't work that way. Suff, suffering is suffering, and each heart will know it. Um, sometimes, however, in life, our suffering occurs because we just focus on all the little things that are going wrong. Uh, and sometimes we just need to look at, at the bright side of things. Um, sometimes we just allow ourselves to have pity parties, which, which are not appropriate. Uh, it's not appropriate suffering. Sometimes we just simply need to refuse to allow this little rotten thing to ruin my day. And I'm not talking about the kids. <laughs> There are, you know, there's just, sometimes there's just little things in life, and, and we just have to say, you know what, I'm not going to let that bother me. Um, however, uh, there are lots of times when we can't overlook. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. It works sometimes on some little things, but it doesn't work all the time. There's a lot of legitimate suffering that, that we will endure, as a matter of fact, in Isaiah chapter 53, Jesus was called a man of sorrows, acquainted with griefs. So if it was only a matter of just overlooking the little problems that I shouldn't be looking at, what, how do we explain Jesus, man of sorrows? So there is sorrow. There is legitimate sorrow. It is a part of life, and it's not just a matter of just overlooking this, this little thing. Um... So we really need to look at the Bible, what the Bible, at what the Bible has to say about suffering uh, to know how to live. Uh, I want to start with a, f a few verses. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. James chapter 1. Consider it all joy, my brethren, <clears throat> when you encounter various trials. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The common theme in these verses here is the certainty of suffering. We should not be surprised. But isn't that ex exactly what we are? <laughs> Just about without fail. We forget. We think our life ought to be problem-free. Uh, you know, we have some family problem. Who sinned? You know, what, uh, why, you know, why me? Why is this happening to me? That's the question we, we tend to keep asking instead of remembering, oh yeah, it's, it's when is this going to happen to me, not why is this happening to me. <clears throat> uh, there's a number of things that, that we can kind of lump into suffering. Persecution is one. Hardship. Trials. Sometimes it's fiery darts from Satan. Uh, there's also, however, suffering that <clears throat> is uh, something we should avoid. Uh, 1 Peter 4.15 says, Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. And, you know, we probably can't uh, understand, uh, you know, we don't, we don't identify too well with the murderer, or the thief, or the evildoer, but how about the, the meddler? <laughs> Sometimes we meddle. Uh, <clears throat> so, 
there is suffering that, that we should avoid, suffering that comes as a direct result of our sin, and, and God says, don't, that's not the kind of suffering that we should be, that we should be doing. If the city is persecuting you, maybe it's because you haven't paid the parking ticket for parking in the handicap zone, right? That's, that's, that's not, just pay the ticket, don't park in the handicap zone. We don't need to be persecuted that way. That, that's not the good part of suffering. Uh, you know, if you have a splinter, take it out. All right, we don't have to go around, oh yeah, my. if you have a splinter, take it out. Don't park in the handicap zone. Don't, we don't need to bring suffering upon ourselves. Uh, there's not, that's not the, the part of suffering that we want to be involved in. Um, <clears throat> some things can be simply dealt with like that. Um, sometimes it is, our suffering is a result of our sin. However, uh, a lot of times, um, you know, remember, we, we want to blame too much on our sin. And we start to suffer and we just go, oh, huh, what do I do now? You know, I probably just, I just brought this on myself. You know, the, <clears throat> when, uh, remember the disciples came up to Jesus. They had this man born blind. They said, they said, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Why was he born blind? Jesus said, neither. So, so we need to look at our sin, but we can also be too quick to just simply assume that every problem in our life is just due to our own sin, and we lose the benefit of, of suffering the way we should. There's a, a number of passages that I wanted to uh, uh, go over and, and different aspects of suffering, and I was trying to kind of put it in a box and categorize it, and that wasn't, wasn't working for me. <laughs> so I want to actually just, just read some passages here and, and comment on them, and it may not be in order, but uh, it's just what we're going to do. So um, Hebrews uh, chapter 2, verse 9, uh, we read, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because... We see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So we uh, see here in this passage, Jesus suffering, suffering for us. And we see that God says that because of Jesus' suffering, he was crowned with glory and honor. And then we also read that it is fitting since it was fitting for God to perfect his own son through sufferings, that, that since we are his brothers, that's going to apply to us. So if, <laughs> if God brought suffering to his son and that was part of his glory and if he perfected his own son through sufferings, then we should expect suffering also. Um, sometimes we want to just run from suffering in any way, shape, or form, and, and that's not the right attitude. 1 Peter 2.19, we read, For this finds favor, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But... If when you do what is right and suffer for it and patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Again, when the trials come, it's really not if, it's when. Um... And, you know, as far as that goes, we, we need to count the cost. We need to be prepared and ready to suffer. And, um, 
you know, some, some may say, well, you know what, I just want a happy life. <laughs> I, don't want that, I don't want that part. And some may say, you know what, if that's what being a Christian is, skip it, I don't want to suffer. But the, the sad thing is, we, we are going to, as we talked at the beginning, we're all going to suffer anyhow. You can't really escape it. It's a wishful thinking to, to think you can just escape it all. There is going to be more for a Christian because we're going to have to be like Christ. We need to follow in his footsteps. He left us an example for us to follow in his steps. But if we're going to suffer anyway, we might, might as well be a Christian and suffer and have some gain for it. First Corinthians, uh, excuse me, Second Corinthians chapter 1. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also is our comfort abundant through Christ. But if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient endurings of the, enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. So yes, we will follow in Christ's footsteps. If we are going to follow in Christ's footsteps, we're going to suffer. However, we also get the comfort of God. If the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also is the comfort abundant. If you want to experience comfort, take suffering. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So sometimes the persecution is, can be more direct. Um, sometimes suffering hardship. First Peter chapter 4. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer, a thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is difficult that the righteous be saved, what will become of the godless, godless man and the sinner? Therefore, those also who suffer according to the will of God shall entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. We need to entrust ourselves to God in our suffering. And uh, another point I'd like to make about this passage here, uh, it says that uh, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. Um, so that at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. I believe that there's going to be rewards for suffering. <laughs> if it gets worse, we got something to be happier about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. And for this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain." So the situation here was, was Paul at, uh, uh, I think, Thessalonica, um, <clears throat> where there had been persecution, and then they kind of fled the persecution, and then they were split up. Paul was left behind, 
and he had sent back to find out how they were doing. And he reminded them, we told you this was coming. We were destined for this. Um, and, uh, and at the end of that passage we just read, he said he was very eager to find out about their faith for fear that the tempter may have tempted them and their labor be in vain. There was a temptation there for them to skip, say, all right, that's it, I'm done, no, no more, I, I give, give up. Uh, no more suffering. Um, it's, it is God's will that we endure, that we face it with joy and rejoice and endurance. And um, so it's a, it's a challenge for us. It was, a cha it was the, the challenge Paul for his own disciples. He says, I'm, look, I'm, I'm concerned. Did you make it? Did you make it through? Or did you quit? That's why we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared now, like Kevin was saying. We need to be thinking about it now. What are we going to do? Are we ready? Yeah. Are we willing? <clears throat> Rather than let it <clears throat> become a surprise to us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what has been promised. I don't even think I'm going to comment on that one. It's just a beautiful <laughs> explanation. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2. Remember Christ Jesus risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we endure, we reign. You see, you see the relationship in a lot of these passages between the suffering and the glory, the reward. Don't throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Allow the seizure of your property, knowing that you have a better possession and a lasting one reward in heaven. So, Romans 8.18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We'll read that one more time. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. When I've read this passage before, it made me think that, uh, it's trying to minimize suffering. You know, there's so much glory, don't worry about the suffering. As I've looked at it more, I think it's the opposite. I don't think it's trying to minimize the suffering. It's trying to maximize the glory. If the sufferings aren't worthy to comp be compared with the glory, and it's not saying th that you shouldn't think you're suffering much because it, it doesn't compare. What it's saying is that th the suffering that you're enduring, the glory is so much more, it's not even comparable. It's not saying that it doesn't really hurt now. It's just saying the, the glory, the, the blessing, is so much more. The sufferings of the, the genuine, legitimate sufferings of this present time, 
compared to the tremendous glory that it's going to work out is incomparable. It's tremendous encouragement for us to in that day rejoice, to consider it all joy in that day because of the incomparable glory that shall result. Now, as I was studying this, I'm going to switch subjects just a little bit. They're very related, and it really got me onto this another line of uh, thought here. And hopefully you'll see how they're really related. But um, <clears throat> I want to read Mark chapter 10, uh, which uh, J James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do? And they said, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left hand in your glory. <laughs> but Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or my left, that is not mine to give, but it is for those to whom it has been prepared. And hearing this, the ten disciples began to feel indignant with James and John, and calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, Fellas, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and, and great men exercise authority o over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So James and John wanted to sit on Jesus' right and left position of greatest glory and Jesus first thing is can you drink the cup I'm going to drink in other words the glory is related to the suffering and uh, you know we'll, we'll find out someday who's sitting there but <laughs> but um, I, I think there's a genuine relationship there between the suffering and the glory um, and then he goes into this uh, uh, admonition to all of them. Look, you want greatness? Be the servant. The greatest among you is the servant of all. Um, I want to talk about greatness for just a minute. Because I think we may not always think rightly about this. You know, what do we consider a successful Christian life? We tend to think about doing great things for God. But is, but is, that, the, but is that the scriptural definition? Uh, Paul was a great hero, right? He's probably all of our heroes. Was Paul great because he was a great teacher? Was he great because he wrote so many books of the Bible? You know, it was God's Word. He was writing God's inspired Word. Anybody could have written it. <laughs> but in Corinth, in Corinth, uh, there were teachers coming in who were trying to sway the Corinthians. And Paul actually, uh, at Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, compared himself to these teachers uh, in order to encourage the Corinthians to hold to the, the true teaching that he was teaching them. He said, and he goes, in, he goes into a little story. He said, are, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if insane. It's, it's, he's saying, look, it's kind of insane for us to be comparing teachers here. Are they servants of Christ? I more so. 
I more and far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. What made Paul great? It was his suffering. Not that he was some great leader or teacher or preacher. A successful Christian life, I think the question is not, what have I done for God, but what have I suffered for God? How have I been a servant? It's not how big is the church or how big is the work or how many people are we reaching. It's how have I suffered? That's, that's the model. That's the guy we, want to, we should be following. Ladies, I, I want to talk to you for a minute, not just you, but... <laughs> And I want to remind that all of you ladies, in Christ, there is neither male nor female. In this life, God has ordained men to be the leaders, the preachers. He gave the woman as the helpmeet. But in Christ, it's not that way. But you got two people, somebody's got to be the leader. That's it just that's how it works. And that's how God designed it. But in God's kingdom, and being great in God's kingdom, there is no difference between men and women. The greatest among you is the servant of all. If, if we think there's going to be just tons of men up to be the great ones in heaven, who tends to be the servant of all? Tends to be the ladies. Who tends to suffer more? <laughs> I won't tell answer the question. <laughs> if the way to glory is suffering and the way to greatness is servanthood, ladies, there, there's no man ahead of you. If because of God's word, you're keeping a home, and honoring a husband and raising children in the instruction and discipline of the Lord, are you doing God's work? If you suffer in that capacity, are you suffering for Christ? Absolutely. It doesn't just have to be on the front lines. The preacher, the missionary, the guy who's up front, the leader, that's not, what, that's not what scriptural greatness is about. It's about the servant. It's about the suffering. It's about humility. I think there's going to be, as I think about this, I think there's going to be far more women at the head of the line in heaven than we have any clue. And it's a challenge for all of us to be the servant and to welcome the suffering. There's another, one more aspect I'd like about, to talk about, and that is Job. How about Job? He suffered. Did, he, did Job suffer for the Lord? Did he suffer for Christ's sake? Well, he certainly wouldn't have known it. 
He didn't know it, right? There's certainly no direct correlation there. Just everything went wrong, really wrong. Job suffered as a testimony to angels. Sometimes we don't understand why we're suffering. 1 Corinthians 4.9 says this, For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle <clears throat> because we have become a spectacle to the world both to angels and to men. Very interesting passage. Probably don't know what it means. <laughs> but Job was a spectacle to angels. Paul says we are a spectacle both to angels and to men. Maybe your suffering has nothing to do with this world. Maybe it's a testimony to in the heavenlies, like Job. Revelation 3, 5 says, He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. There's no... You, you may suffer in secret. That could be very appropriate. Maybe for God and the angels. The key thing is for us to endure, as the scripture says here, to endure and to face it with joy. To know that the reward is coming. But we need to be ready. We need to be ready for persecution and just for suffering. I want to close with a testimony. Um, something that, that really opened my eyes along these lines. Um, Uh, with the birth of our latest child, Charlotte, um, Ginger and I felt led to, we had home births before that, but we felt led to go to a hospital. There's a, a lot of you know some of the circumstances there, but we felt led to use a hospital rather than a midwife at, at this time. And... Um, uh, it, probably most of you remember sending out prayers. We had a breach, and then it wasn't breach, and then it was breach again, and it wasn't breach again. <laughs> and uh, you know, it was very interesting. The doctor had told us uh, when the first time he turned the baby, we said, you know, well, what's what could happen? You know, he said, yeah, the baby can flip back. He says, you know, once he said, once you're in labor, it's the baby really can't flip. He said, well. He says, well, nothing's ever 100%. <laughs> Basically, the baby can't flip, but nothing's ever 100%. <laughs> well, guess what? In, in our situation, we went into labor, the baby was head down, and the baby flipped in labor. Shouldn't really be possible. Well, <clears throat> after it was all was said and done, we had the C-section. Uh, he came to talk to us, and he says, he says, says I've got to tell you, guys some stuff now. He says, uh, he said, uh, Ginger has a very unique uterus. And, and for the kids, the uterus is just a fancy name for the, the mommy's tummy. <laughs> God made a special place for the babies to grow. It's called the uterus. And uh, he says, you know, normally a uterus is like a light bulb. It's kind of long and skinny and it's kind of fat on top and skinny on the bottom. He said, your uterus is not that way. He said, your uterus is round. And he said, usually it's, it's thick on top and it's thin on the bottom. And the whole reason that God designed it to be that way is it's thick on top and the muscles contract and it pushes the baby out. It's thin down here, it's thick up here, and it contracts and pushes the baby out. Yours is, is thick all the way around. He said, it's especially thick on the bottom. It's, it's like it's upside down. Uh, I said, well... 
you know, what do you mean by, by thick anyway? He says, he says really thick. <laughs> he said, I had to sew up three layers of a muscle. He said, usually, usually just one. And uh, I said, well, in, this is an older doctor. He's close to retirement. He's been around a long, long time. I said, I said just, just so I know, how much, how much thicker, you know, is it just, how much thicker is it? I said, he said, it's the thickest one I've ever seen. I said, how much thicker? I mean, it's just, you know, he said, her uterus is 20 to 30 times thicker than any I've ever seen before. That's significant. You know, we've had a lot of difficulties in all of our labors. We, we talked to him. He says, look, we, we can't know all that happened in the past. I said, could this, could this just happen? No. He says, no. He says, I can't guarantee you that every, her uterus has always been like this. It may have changed over time. But knowing your history with the difficult labors all the way along, he says, yeah, probably, probably it's been like this. You know, we always viewed all of our births as a miracle, and certainly they are, and certainly every birth is. We just didn't know how much <laughs> difficulty we were enduring. <laughs> um, because the uterus was fighting itself this whole time. It wasn't pushing the baby out like it should. It was pushing, it was thickest at the bottom, it was pushing the wrong way. And um, talk about pain, there was so much more muscle there, and it was, the whole thing was fighting itself this, the whole time. You know, and I got to thinking about this. Is this a coincidence? You know, when, before Ginger and I were married, we both felt convicted of the Lord that he wanted us to trust him with how many children that we would have and to have a large family. And that was just our conviction. And that's not everybody's conviction. That's not what, the, what I'm talking about here. But that was our conviction. And, and it was actually one of the first conversations we ever had with each other. <laughs> it was about kids. <laughs> uh, and so when we were married, we both, we felt of the Lord that this is what he wanted for us to do. And, you know, it was really easy the first time. <laughs> But, um, but we have stuck with it. We said, Lord, we trust you, you know? And um, so what, what's the chance that this, this woman who's willing to have 11 kids so far has the most unusual, difficult uterus that by a long shot? I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence. God could have changed it and he knew it. You know, why didn't he give somebody else the conviction to have a bunch of kids? <laughs> you know, I, I, I just can't help think, but like Job, he gave Ginger this problem. He said, will you trust me? I can't help but believe that the angels weren't all up in heaven going, she's doing it again. Come and look. And, you know, we actually should have so many, because of the round shape, we should have all breech babies. Because he, the doctor says, you know, he flipped, he flipped the baby. So many times, he flipped the baby just before he did the C-section even. He says, the reason I could flip it because there was nothing there to stop me from flipping it. It's the wrong shape. It was just, all I had to do was just kind of spin the baby around. <laughs> the, whole thing, he said, the whole thing, you know, was round like a basketball. So, you know, we should have had so many breech babies and, and so many problems and complications. And it's no wonder that her labors were so difficult and so long. It, it wasn't working. But she did it for Jesus. Because she believed that God told her, this is what I want you to do. And we just happened to get this tiny peak. If, if she hadn't had a C-section, we'd never know. We'd still just go, yeah. <laughs> 
And, and I, you know what? I don't think that peak was for us. That's part of why I'm preaching this sermon. I don't think the, I don't think the revelation was for us. I think it's for somebody else. The, the suffering that you've got, you just don't know what it's about. You know, we don't think about having babies for Jesus, but, but, but that's what we're supposed to do. Everything we do, everything we live for the Lord. Now, you know what? I've got to go on lots of mission trips and I've got to do lots of ministry and I get to come up here and preach sometimes. But I'm telling you what, in the kingdom of heaven, I have hardly suffered. I've had a little bit of persecution here and there, not much. I'm telling you, my wife is so far ahead of me because of what she has suffered for Jesus. It's not even close. We don't know. We don't understand. So the difficulty that you have, rejoice. Endure. We need to broaden our horizon. Suffering for Jesus isn't just going on the street corner and having people throw rotten fruit at you or put a gun to your head and say, if you deny Jesus, I'm going to kill you. It's a lot more than that. And ginger sufferings through these 11 births are nothing compared to the incredible weight of glory she's going to have in heaven someday. And like Kevin said, we just we need to be ready. We need to be ready. We need to be thinking about it. So, thank you.